Good evening, and thank you for joining us for the third listening tour with superintendent and the school board member. My name is Sheree Johnson. I'm the director of the Office of Strategic Communication and Community Engagement. We also have our superintendent, Dr. Bruce Benson, as well as school board vice chair, Mr. Scott Hirons. This is the third and final listening tour of the year. We host three listening tours a year in different parts of the county. It's a chance for parents to come out in the school division to speak to the superintendent and school board members in a town hall setting. The listening tour is part of both the communication and strategic plan. This evening, you have the opportunity to engage directly with school leaders and provide input on issues that impact students and families. It's important for school leaders to have a conversation with parents. Better community and parent engagement is one of the top priorities for the communication office. Most of you signed in at the door and we really appreciate it. You also placed your questions on note cards. During this meeting, I will serve as the moderator and read your questions. The superintendent and Mr. Hirons will answer the questions. You can also continue to fill out cards with your questions and the communications team will come around and pick up the questions and bring them up to me. If we do not have an answer, we will respond to you within several days with information. Again, thank you for joining us and now I would like to introduce our superintendent, Dr. Bruce Benson, for a brief PowerPoint presentation. Check. Oh, there we go. So we clearly, I was saying, we clearly need to change the name of this, right, to an intimate conversation with whoever's here. But thank you for being here. Um, I do want to share just a little bit about some really exciting work that we're, we're getting started in the division that is actually tied to a number of questions that came in uh, electronically, because we had folks that submitted questions via, um, by email about um, how do we, how are we going to ensure that our kids are college ready, what kind of uh, metrics are we using to determine that? How are we changing our expectations in the division as a whole to ensure that kids are, are, are prepared for whatever it is that they want to do next, whether it's they want to go to work or they want to go to further education, uh, military, whatever that is, we want kids to be ready to do whatever that next thing is. So I'm going to just very quickly talk about this um, effort called uh, C5W. Uh, learning walks, which is going to become the framework for our uh, curriculum across the division as a whole. Um, this may s seem surprising to some of you, is that we, we don't really have a division curriculum. We have, uh, you know, in an AP class, it's the AP curriculum. In an IB class, it's the IB curriculum. Uh, in a, a fifth grade math class, it's the um, Virginia standards of learning. There, there should be more than that to us as a school division in terms of our expectations for our young people. Um, some of the more progressive divisions in Virginia have had that in place for a while. We need to do that work, which is what we're getting ready to do um, beginning this summer. So we, we're using a learning walk model that is very much like an instructional rounds model where we go in and we observe what kids are doing in classes and the level of response that we're getting uh, based upon what we're asking them to do. For example, is that level of cognitive demand in their response appropriately high as, as the question that was, that was asked. So it's rather than focusing on what the teacher's doing, we're going to focus on what the kids are doing and what the teacher is asking kids to do um, in that class and trying to determine if they're really engaged or they're just compliant. They're doing what the kids are, what the teacher is asking them to do. We want our kids to be engaged. I think it's tough to be engaged if you're not having an original thought. I would love all of our kids to have original thoughts and, um, and you know, develop a skill set that will help them be successful, whether they're going on to further education or they're going to enter the, the workforce. So that's, that's part of what we're, we're doing here. Uh, we kind of label them all century skills because, quite frankly, I don't know a century where um, these, these skills would not have been valued. What's different are the tools that we have access to today, and we want our kids to be able to use those tools efficiently, effectively. But you think about what we want them to do, think critically, uh, be a good collaborator, collaborator. Well, those have been important, like, forever, right? It was different how we, how we did them in the past. Uh, this is not an evaluation model. This is about how we improve our expectations for outcomes across the division um, as a whole. I frequently hear from folks, well, there are a lot of opportunities for, for kids that um, you know, might be in the top quartile of performance, uh, things like the governor's school. We have a lot of support structures for kids that might be struggling, but we don't have a model that addresses every kid. And this, this will address every student in the division, every content area. So we want to be good communicators, and we want our folks to know what they're learning, why it's important. What, what is, why is it relevant to them? And I'm hoping that the answer is not, it's going to be on the SOL test. 
Okay, so how are you going to be able to use this uh, at some point in the future? And being a good communicator across um, you know, all different kinds of areas, listening, writing, etc. To be able to work with other people uh, and, and, and affect a positive outcome, to think critically, and we have to ask our kids you know, routinely to, to do that. And we want to see more opportunities to work at that, uh, application, analyze, um, and evaluate and create synthesized kind of level. We're really good at asking basic knowledge and comprehension questions. Uh, we need to make sure that we're asking the other questions that cause our kids to think more deeply about what they're doing. If you use the SAT as a measure, uh, we're kind of average as, as far as the state goes, um, not hitting the college ready numbers on the SAT test. You, know, you can think what you want about the SAT test, but it is an independent measure. It is largely an, an analytical test. Our kids need to have lots of opportunities to think critically and analyze, and we want to make sure that's happening uh, throughout the division. Uh, we want our kids to be creative be good citizens and pursue an active, healthy uh, lifestyle. We want them to be resilient. We want them to know what to do when things aren't going the way they think they should be going for them. And this sounds really bad, but it, you know, if our kids are gonna fail, I want them to fail with us so that we can help them figure out how to deal with that failure. And I don't want that first time that they fail to be in a college level class or in the workplace because they may not know what to do if they haven't had that kind of support system to help them figure, figure it out. So those, that's our C5W, and then uh, we're also going to be looking again at engagement. And again, we want, we want our kids to be um, authentically engaged and not just compliant. You know, some students are really good at just doing what we ask them to do, and that's, that's okay. But I don't know that that really says that kids are engaged in what we're, we're trying to have them experience in classrooms. So we have had already about 900 teachers participate in, in this experience, and uh, we have a bunch more planned for this summer. We're having a teaching and learning um, institute coming up uh, that's going to be at the end of June. We're paying our teachers to participate, which is a first. We're going to have 500 teachers. Uh, they're getting $500 uh, for, for the week. Uh, every person is getting a, a Chromebook because we're moving to uh, Google Apps as our shared platform within the division. So that's not happened before either. We have not assigned a person a piece of technology to do their job. And I think that's kind of what you do with professionals, right? If, you're, if you need to have access to technology, I think we should make it accessible to them. So uh, we will be doing that. Um, we're trying to connect all of this to um, school improvement planning uh, through our strategic plan, so it's very purposeful. We expect folks to come out of the, the, the time together this summer with action plans that they'll implement in the, um, in the fall. Uh, it's an opportunity to share I ideas and content vertically. You know, it's kind of important that folks in elementary school know what's coming in middle school, middle school folks know what's supposed to be coming in high school and then back down. For example, um, the, the concept of cell in biology occurs three times in our curriculum, once at the elementary level, once at the middle school level, and once at the high school level. Uh, we don't increase in complexity necessarily what we ask kids to do with the concept of cell. Uh, they typically make a cell model. So in elementary, it might be a cake, and in middle school, it might be a jello mold. I don't know that we increase the level of cognitive demand that we were looking in their response, but we should have. And so how do we figure out how to ramp that up as kids move from kindergarten through grade, through grade 12? So it's an opportunity to have, for us to have that connection across the division as a whole. And again, we are looking for a higher level of engagement in our classrooms. We have outstanding teaching and learning occurring across the division as a whole. I want everybody to know that. Um, but there are also places where there could be some improvement. And so we want to have a consistent expectation for what that would look like. And um, we, th we think this is going to get us there. So with that, we're going to go back to the questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Benson. OK, and now I will open it up for questions. Thank you so much for putting your questions on the cards. We'll start first um, with Christine O'Connor. I teach at H.H. Poole Middle School, where my son is a rising eighth grader. Um, he's taking Latin to fill a slot, knowing he'll switch later. I'm a math and French certified teacher. Can we not find a way to bring this option to not only him, but to all Poole students? This would provide them consistency in their choice of languages being offered to them at their high schools later. Shouldn't we offer more language options, if possible, in our county, as our county strives for excellence? Thank you. Yes, sure. Okay. <laughs> so we, we made a change a couple of years ago to, uh, that involved not transporting our young people um, 
from middle schools to participate in world language or the advanced math classes by having uh, the instruction delivered at the school level for a couple of reasons. One is that there was a fair amount of time that was being lost in transporting our young people. There's also a cost associated with that with that transportation. And we basically were running um, students between our high schools and middle schools quite frequently during the course of the day, as well as between high schools. So we've, we've adopted a model where um, we have the teacher move, essentially, for advanced level math or for um, a world language. We've committed to the board initially to have two world languages um, minimally at each one of our uh, middle schools. There is absolutely room for, um, for improvement there, and one of the things that um, we expect to happen is that we assess what the demand is for um, other languages, and then if we have staff that are certified and we can make that work, then we would expect to be able to have um, other offerings as, as well. So we'll, we'll look into that because we should be checking to see what the, what the demand is. Uh, I will, will say this, is that it, it, it's going to be difficult for, of course, for us to offer every language that might, there might be an interest in. But if there's enough to have a class and we have the FTE to be able to um, offer it, we, we, we want to look at that. Um, for in terms of students that want to pursue a language that would not be that language that they're starting with, let's say they're starting with Spanish and they're going to go to, they want to go to French when they get to the high school level. We have asked the high schools to schedule their classes in such a manner that students could get their five years of that particular world language if they wanted that as a target um, once they got to high school. Um, but there's also something else that we're, we're really excited about in the area of world language is that we, we want to make sure that our kids, when they come out of our world language program, is that they can actually communicate in that language, as in speak and understand when sp spoken to, whatever that target language is. And in, in some uh, areas in the, in the division, it, that, that instruction has been largely grammatical and vocabulary. Uh, and so that doesn't get us there. We have a, a brand new uh, world language and culture coordinator that uh, was is part of our reorganization in our uh, Department of uh, Learning and Organizational Development that very much embraces being able to communicate as a desired outcome of our world languages opportunities. So I, I think there's going to be some, be some growth there. And from a school board perspective, I think, you know, we had to make the hard decision uh, two years ago, three years ago, where we reduced the amount of foreign language available in, in the middle schools. And that was mostly, or it was driven by much as anything because of the transportation costs that we were incurring for transporting the kids to the high schools to make sure everybody got access to foreign languages. Well, we had a student, um, for example, for part of the cost, we had a student that was at Drew Middle School. He's in a very small area that attend, for kids that attend Drew Middle School, that their, his attendance zone for high school was Brook Point. We had to transfer, he, he rode the bus to Brook Point in the morning. We had to send an entire bus um, to pick him up from Brook Point, ride by himself all the way back to middle school. That's that's where some of the costs are driven, and that's you know some of those requirements and regulations are driven by the state, um, by uh, Department of Transportation on how to safely transport these kids. That's why we had to use an entire bus. It makes sense to send him a U Uber, but we can't do that obviously. Um, but from the school board perspective, we do want to get back to, I think. Um, having full opportunity for eighth graders to experience foreign language and as many languages as possible. Um, the person who asked the question is, is certified in multiple languages. Duplicate yourself, put yourself on a Xerox machine and copy, 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 because that's what we need. We need more teachers with, uh, with that, they, that capability and ability to teach those multiple languages, because that would make it a heck of a lot easier to be able to deliver it um, at all of our schools, if, if each of the if each of the middle schools had um, folks with multiple languages, it's going to make it a lot easier for these folks to be able to schedule that and um, get that done and, and measure that demand. But uh, Dr. Benson kind of stole my thunder. Some of what I was thinking about it is in this year's budget, we did fund um, the reorganization of the Department of Learning, and a part of that is this uh, World Language Coordinator and. I think I'm as, as, as excited as anybody on the school board for what that, what that is going to bring to our division. Um, you know, I, I, I hope it's going to have a very positive effect on our for, how we deliver foreign language. About my first year on the board, and actually before Dr. Benson's term, uh, before Dr. Benson started with us, 
not necessarily his term. <laughs> um, we had a member of the Board of Supervisors really kind of rail on us about how we deliver foreign language and, you know, it's a waste of time for most students in, in foreign language and kind of opened my eyes. It's like, well, if that's how our funding body views it, it's probably how the general public views it. So I've always kind of kept an eye on foreign language and I'm really excited about uh, what we're bringing with C5W as a whole, but what that means to things as specific as foreign language. So I think we're going to get, we're going to improve things and I appreciate your service and uh, we will try to use those skills as much as possible, as often as possible. Okay. Our next question. What are you doing to reduce sizes of middle school classes? I teach and I have 35 kids in a math class. Oh, I, I'll start with the school board perspective again. Uh, this, this board is pretty committed to class size reduction. Um, our class sizes kind of grew and grew and grew, much as the county has grown. Um, and two years ago, we adopted a budget that had a specific initiative to reduce class sizes in elementary school. Our intent was start with elementary schools, move on to middle schools and high schools. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get as far as we wanted to this year as far as just the pure funding side of it um, to be able to reduce or, or increase the number of staff members available to be able to help reduce those classes. Um, I have been told by Dr. Benson and administration, I don't know if he wants to elaborate on this, um, they are looking at scheduling uh, issues that have arisen um, or, or that they've noticed within the middle school buildings. Um, if I'm saying this correctly or if I'm saying it wrong, just throw something at me. Uh, to try to, that, that, that they are creating some of the challenges of the high class sizes. So they are looking at some just uh, methodologies to try to reduce class sizes based on the staff and the buildings that we have now. Um, I'm pretty excited about that. I hope we see some results of that coming this um, new school year. Um, I, my intention going into the budget year this year was to uh, continue the challenge, continue to charge the charge to uh, reduced class sizes across the board and attacking um, middle schools in particular. I'm in pretty close contact with a teacher at Drew Middle School, um, an English and social studies teacher who is always reminding me of the class sizes in um, the core classes in middle schools. Um, and I told her, I, my response to her is I'm, I'm not stopping my charge until we actually have some success in reducing class sizes from the start to the finish. I think you, you got that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Next, and I'll try to make sure I say your name right, Amy Calamillary. Okay. When is Berry Farm Elementary School finally going to be a priority and get its rebuild? I moved here in 2010, and at that time it was scheduled for 2015. Our school is awesome, and I would love for our students and teachers to have a facility that reflects that. Thank you. I'll answer on behalf of Dwayne. <laughs> he, uh, Dwayne is, is not going to let us um, not hear about the challenges at Ferry Farm, and he is fighting very, very hard. I'm sure he's probably stuck in traffic. Um, very, very hard for, on behalf of the Ferry Farm uh, student body to uh, get that school rebuilt, renovated, whatever it takes, um, because he is right. Um, a few years ago, it, it came up on the CIP, it, it, you know, it bubbled up onto the CIP to um, rebuild, and some of the projects that were planned there were brought down or reduced in scope possibly or moved back with the expectation of that school uh, potentially being rebuilt. <clears throat> um, now as we've moved on and the county continues to grow, we've been hit with the challenge of we do need high school number six, we need a new high school. We only have so much debt right now that we can take on as a county, and that's being eat up, eaten up um, within the CIP uh, uh, amongst both Ferry Farm and uh, Hartwood Elementary to be either rebuilt or renovated, Drew Middle School to be renovate, renovated, and now we have the challenge of High School 6, and also the uh, county needs a new courthouse. Um, they're, they're just as challenged as we are with the courthouse, um, and a need for a better facility 
there because, of course, the county's growing, so there's more activity. Um, yeah, and so that is absolutely one of the challenges. Um, the Board of Supervisors has worked really hard to uh, uh, achieve their AAA bond ratings, which is, it is good for the county. I think there are some strategies there, and I've been advocating um, to Meg Baumke, uh, our member of the Board of Supervisors here, Bob Thomas from George Washington District, to let's take a look at that debt capacity. Where can we either expand that or, or you know, create some additional capacity there that we can, do, we can accomplish all these things? Now, this year we did adopt a CIP that still includes uh, the rebuild of Ferry Farm, rebuild or renovation of Hartwood, yep, yep, and renovation of Drew Middle School, along with uh, language about the high school number six and the court, courthouse. Um, what our expectation is, is over the next several months, well actually over the next uh, month and a half or so, um, we are working with the Board of Supervisors on a new CIP process to be able to look at each project individually, rate it on it and score it on its level of necessity and the impact to the community, et cetera, and, um, and then measure projects as a whole and prioritize based on the, the level of need, the impact to the community, et cetera. I'm sure uh, Dwayne's gonna be very, very involved in that and advocating very hard for the Ferry Farm. I've told him that I'm, I'm gonna support him on what he wants to do with that and direction he wants to go. So hopefully it's coming. So as Mr. Heimer said, there, there's a placeholder right now. We have about $120 million that's, that is available to us in the CIP, and then we're gonna have to, to take a look at those projects and, and, and re-rank them using an agreed upon um, rubric for assessment that both local government and schools will use together. Um, and we, in, in anticipation of that, we have gone back and updated a study that we had done for Ferry Farm, Hartwood, and Drew to make sure that we have a good handle on what the challenges are within the current facilities so that that will help us figure out where in the CIP uh, those projects may need to land. So weather for you. <clears throat> All right. I do. And one more question from Amy. Will there be a new calendar committee survey about moving up the school start time? The last one was manipulative and clearly biased. Thank you. So, yes. How's that? <laughs> so here, here's, the, here's the thing is that the, 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 the original survey went out was to just to assess interest in certain elements that would be represented in a, in a new calendar. And it was very much modeled after a survey that was used in a neighboring, um, a neighboring school division. Uh, clearly, there is some interest in us exploring those options, okay? And, and we, we, we saw that in the first assessment. There were some issues in the manner in which the first assessment was, um, was, was delivered. Uh, not being able to control the number of responses would be one of those things. So if you wanted to take it 100 times, uh, you could. Uh, so uh, clearly, though, there's enough interest for us to explore. So what the calendar committee is doing now is they're putting together two options. One is a traditional start, and the other is a pre-Labor Day start. And we're going to put that back out. Uh, for folks to to comment on uh, but we're going to use a direct email uh, connection survey to do that so that each person that is on the email list will have an opportunity to respond uh, once uh, we have really good contact information for middle school and uh, high school uh, parents uh, we're going to be updating our uh, elementary uh, email contact uh, information during the next two weeks okay that's my add to that a little bit it's, I the, the committee structure was different than it was in the years past for the calendar committee. I'm really excited about that too um, because my, my goal with the calendar committee was to get more people involved but get people involved to work towards the calendar. In years past, the calendar committee was kind of made up of, best I could tell, of whoever showed up. Um, there is a group of of parent volunteers and group, and combined with some of our staff working towards this calendar recommendation that will come to us eventually um, I assume within the next couple months uh, for approval of the 1819 school year um, was what, what I was excited about with the uh, survey that went out it got people interested unfortunately 
we don't hear from enough parents until something we do negatively impacts them. Um, I, was, I was actually elated, and I really thought our room would be filled tonight off of that. I guess that has kind of calmed down again, and maybe we gotta do something that ticks them off again and <laughs> fill the room. Um, but I, I was actually pretty excited over that, uh, what was it, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when it went out, and people, I mean, it, it, you know, it drummed up conversations everywhere on Facebook, on social media. Um, I got hit up in the grocery store, got hit up in my neighborhood, what is this, what is this about, got on baseball fields. I'm happy to talk to people about school, so, uh, you know, sometimes there's a silver lining in everything. So we had 7,025 uh, folks participate in the, in the survey, and, and again, clearly enough interest for us to consider another option, but also we heard from some folks that like this, get the calendar the way it is, so again, we're going we're gonna to develop two, and then we're going to reassess, but we're going to do a direct email um, survey this time. Okay. This question is from Mrs. Shires. If there is a threat made from one child to another, is there a set standard for punishment, a minimum, for example? This is operations. So okay. <laughs> so we, we do have standards, and we, we actually work with administrators in the division and, and talk about the consistency in, in implementation. But you know, like, like any number of um, issues that we deal with our young people, there are elements to uh, some of these that are different in each one of the cases. And that is really hard sometimes for parents to, to understand, is that, that, that it might not be exactly the same outcome as it was over here. And because of, of student privacy, we, we can't discuss what's different about those two uh, situations. I, I will say this, that any time there is a question about whether or not we have an appropriate level of response given whatever the, the issue is, we have folks at the division level that are routinely um, contacted to give some input as to well, what, what would be the appropriate thing to do here. Uh, we, we had some of that occur today. Um, so, it, you know, it's not, it's not hard and fast, I would just say that. There are certain offenses that absolutely get um, a, a, a standard response, but then there are circumstances with any number of these issues that, that, that make the response somewhat um, different, okay? And it's just that we're not, we're not in a position to be able to talk about what those differences are. Um, but we have a code of conduct that very clearly says what are acceptable behaviors, what are not, uh, that is being reviewed and will be updated uh, and um, will we'll be out to uh, schools this summer for distribution in the, in the fall. And you know, it, it's really important to us that, that young people understand what their role is in our school community, whether it's in a classroom or within the, within the school or on the playground or um, in a, at a sporting event. Uh, we, have, we have a code of conduct. We expect our young people to um, to abide by that code of conduct and we will take appropriate uh, disciplinary action. It's just that sometimes that action may vary a, a little bit based upon the circumstances in that particular um, incident. Yeah, and from my perspective, absolutely, because I have a son, a middle schooler who's been involved in a couple things where, you know, not necessarily overly proud of sometimes or very proud sometimes because he's on the other side of it. Um, and even as a school board member, I'm not privy to some of the information that I see that seems like, well, why is that happening to my kid but not happening to this kid? I, I accept the fact that, uh, you know, we're not always privy to all of the information, um, but I trust our administration are typically doing, or almost always doing the right thing, and there's, there's a level of trust there that they know what's going on, they have the full information. Um, and from a school board perspective, we do have the code of conduct. And most of the offenses on the code of conduct has a range of punishment, and that's what you're typically seeing. Um, something within that range is being applied um, to students. Okay, all right. And the next question, uh, Mr. David Starr. How is the board making plans for school choice federal voucher programs, allowing federal taxpayers to move their money to private schools? I guess from the kind of political spectrum, political view of that is um, we don't know. We don't know what's going to be coming down the line either from the federal um, side or even the state side. Of course, there's a lot of activity within the state as well as uh, the General <coughs> Assembly, I think the last two sessions have passed legislation 
um, to make charter schools more easily accessible within the state. Um, the charter schools are have a, have a bit of a challenge to get up and running um, in the state of Virginia um, in, in a, a standard sense. Um, but there's been a push from the General Assembly. Um, it, frankly, if a Republican wins the governorship, we'll probably see that, see that at the state level. Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a challenge. It's just going to be a, a different perspective of how we're going to have to look at the budget. Um, I don't know if Dr. Benson has been working or, or just even theorizing on what that might look like within our budget, whether it, we get a, a voucher program that we have to adapt to or charter schools that we have to um, fund, essentially, uh, with public funds. Um, it's something that is most certainly coming down the road. I think most of us that get into elective office or public service kind of think about it in theory of what it's going to look like. Um, I trust that, I hope that the state will understand the challenges that it would put on the public school system and will provide us with a wide range of, of opportunities and options to help fund uh, voucher programs, fund um, uh, charter schools, whatever might come down the pipe, and help us help them get those things implemented and help parents with their choice in schools. Okay, one more for uh, Mr. David Starr. How are you going to make sure that Chapter 504 ADHD Learning Disability Child um, to stay with their class without isolating them from the class that they want to be a part of? So, you know, our approach is very much an inclusive approach. And our, our intention is to provide services and support for our young people that is in the least restrictive um, environment. Uh, now we do, you know, certainly have an increase in the number of students that are on 504s, and we've got to figure out a way to manage that moving forward. Uh, which there was an attempt to try and do some of that this past year. It wasn't vetted very well with uh, with our teachers across the division. So we took a step back, and we're going to be revisiting that going into um, going into next year. Um, our uh, student services, I think, does an exceptional job. Of, of providing support for our young people across this division, regardless of what their needs are, and we intend to continue to do that. One thing that, um, you know, the, the presentation that Dr. Benson presented, the C5W, one thing that I love about it is we're looking at it across the board, no matter the ability of the student, the, the, the level of the student, the, the ability and the cognitive ability of the student, C5W applies to students across the board and our learner profile is no matter where the student is within their world and ability, we look at that student as a Stafford County learner, which is, you know, I think it's going to separate us a little bit from a lot of other divisions around us. Well, we also value community, which is is one part of our new strategic plan, and we value diversity and, and all kinds of diversity. So, um, yeah, we're going to take care of each other. Okay, this question is in reference to finals, the exemption policy. What is the rationale behind the two absents do not have to take finals in high school? I have a child who has gone to school with a fever, <coughs> respiratory infection because of this policy. What was the end of that, the last statement question, or thus? Um, what is the rationale behind the two absences do not have to take finals in high school? I have a child who has gone to school with a fever, respiratory infection because of this policy. I'm going to look at Dr. Benson and ask that question because I have a student who has uh, gone to school sick <laughs> to, to try to avoid um, having to take finals, and I have an opinion about taking finals too. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> I have one that <clears throat> will not be popular with um, a number of folks, I think. Um, I, re I really think that whether or not a child is exempt should be whether or not they've demonstrated that they master the content, regardless of how many days they have been in that classroom. So th this is something that's going to be up for some review um, by us. Uh, I think we have a, another question about um, weighting of um, the uh, grades in AP classes dependent upon whether or not you take the exam or not, which I think is ridiculous. Uh, the curriculum is the curriculum, whether you take the exam or not. And so it has the same uh, cognitive demand um, if you're in the class, whether you 
take the exam or not. So we, we have some practices here that are, um, from my perspective, somewhat counterintuitive to, to what you would, you know, would say is in the best interest of, of, of being able to demonstrate the young person has met um, a certain requirement within a class other than the seat time. And I don't think we should be about seat time. Are teachers allowed to raise a child's grade based on SOL advanced scores? My child's math teacher raised all students a full letter grade based on a past advanced score on SOL. I don't know. <laughs> You're going to have to. Guide yeah. So, so I'm I'm not sure. Um, that's the first I have heard of that. Um, so that would be an unusual grading practice. Uh, if that were in place, I would expect that that teacher had communicated that to students at the beginning of the year, so the kids would know that that was an expectation. Um, but we will have to look into that because I, I, I don't know. Why do students only get weighted credits for AP or IB if they take the exam? Is there an equal policy for a DE? What if a child transfers from IB? What if a child transfers from IB in the 11th grade to DE, bio, or English? As juniors begin to narrow down college options, they may decide that DE is a better option, but are penalized for doing so. So I, I already stated my position about the, whether or not you take the test, okay? I, I think that it, it, the, the course is the course, the curriculum is what it is, whether you take the, um, the AP exam or not. And that's something that we're going to be looking at, 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 at considering some changes moving, um, moving forward. The, you know, my, I have a parent advisory group, and I have a representative from every one of the schools, and we've talked about, um, you know, what is our goal? For kids to be prepared for college or to enter college with some transferable credit. And I will tell you that my parent advisory group is pretty much split right down the middle. Uh, about half of them want kids to be prepared for college and uh, you know, believe that that experience that students have in our IB program uh, gets them there, even though the likelihood of getting transferable credit is much lower than it is in an AP class or a DE class. And that is because we largely teach um, SL level IB classes. Now we could offer more um, uh, HI level classes, HL, HL level classes. Um, but I also understand that the IB uh, program um, only allows students to take four of the higher level courses. So that, that's something that we need to take a look at. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. So, so IB classes come on two levers. I guess and I, I might have the, the label wrong, but I'm going to say it anyway, OK? Because it, there's kind of like a standard level and a high level. Did I get it? Oh, I got it right. OK. So uh, the standard level class, um, most colleges and universities, particularly the more, the more competitive ones in Virginia, do not grant credit, no transferable credit for that, OK? Uh, they will for uh, HL level classes. Uh, and they do typically for AP and uh, dual enrollment classes. So, you know, if you're looking for your young person or your young person is looking to be able to, to go into college with a certain number of transferable um, credits, that, that's tougher to do uh, with the IB program. Are kids prepared to be successful in college as a result of participating in the IB program? Well, absolutely. They just don't carry the transferable credit with them. Okay. And this is uh, part of why I hope our a budget priority of re restructuring the, I'm going to get the name of this correct by the end of the school year or by the end of the calendar year, Department of Organizational and Professional Development. Learning and Organizational so Development. <laughs> so, we have challenges just with uh, uh, memorizing names of departments, but, um, but they are going to do hopefully very good work and look at things like this and help guide the school board on any policy changes that need to be done to affect good, good changes. So just, just an aside as to why we changed the name of that department. So that was, that was the Department of Instruction, okay? So I could teach somebody something, doesn't mean necessarily that they learned it, right? But I taught them, okay? So we changed the department to learning as an outcome and organizational development because this is about um, helping our, the adults in the, build, in the buildings uh, do a better job of delivering um, learning. 
And Dr. Martin's is going to make sure we all learn the <laughs> name of the department. <laughs> all right. And this is from transitioning here. Uh, Mr. Jake Jacob, it's related to bus safety. Um, he said, um, you need rear view cameras on buses. Um, a child nearly was hit by a bus um, that was <coughs> stepping out despite um, the rear view mirror. So he was concerned about bus safety. My question to you, if you happen to know, will the new buses that we're buying, we buy uh, somewhere between five and 15 buses a year. We wanna be uh, more than, uh, higher on that number, is it 10 this year? Um, regardless, um, do the new buses come with that type of equipment standard? Yeah, I, I'll have to check, I don't know for sure. Um, we, we, we need to buy about 15 buses a year in order to, to, to replace our, our fleet. Uh, we had to make some reductions in that in this uh, budget that the board just adopted. I think we, it's six that we put in this year. But if, you, if you're thinking about a 15-year replacement cycle, that would be it. Okay. Now, in terms of, and I'll get you, I'll get you one second. Okay. Um, student safety and, and 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 transportation plays a big role in this. Is at the top of our our list. Okay. And there are absolutely technologies that we want to bring. Uh, to bear that will help with that. Uh, we've done some of that with the GPS tracking system that we've put in place so that, that folks know where those, um, where those buses are and we know where they are as well before uh, there, there might be an opportunity to tell us that there's some issue with a, uh, with a bus. Clarification or addition about the cameras, is that what we... Install it on the existing yeah. fleet, right? Sure. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And so, and there are two, diff two different things. Right? And we do need to replace our, our fleet gradually. So it's not that, that, that that's a choice. We do need to buy new buses. And one of the things that we should be looking at is how those buses are equipped. But I will talk with the folks in, in transportation. We'll get some follow-up information about where we are with that. We'll, we'll follow up with you after I get. <coughs> yeah, and the point of the buses is those are being replaced anyway, and I would hope that we are getting as much equipment on them as we can, at least with the new buses. But I'm going to ask Pam, I see she's taking notes here. Um, if one of the things I would like for a future, I also chair our finance and budget committee on the school board, is if we can ask uh, Barry Suddeth, our head of transportation, for an assessment of what we have currently on our buses, uh, our entire bus inventory as far as cameras, um, if we have any that do have, currently have rear view cameras, side cameras, exterior, um, because we do have a, as you know, we have the camera system inside. Um, yeah, and it's great. It's, they provide nice, clear uh, views. Yep, yeah.
So that's the next thing. If we can also get some financial information on costs to add that type of those types of things to our buses, um, because we'll we'll take it on as a, with our budget year next year. You know, if if it's something that we can do and and the level of need is there, which I've heard from a lot of constituents about, why can't you send video of of cars that go around stop buses with their flash flashers on? to the sheriff's office and prosecute them. Well, we have some challenges with the state code to be able to do that, but I know some of our buses, I don't know if any of our buses have those actual exterior side cameras. So it's something that I've been meaning to uh, kind of hit, hit these guys up on to get information. Yeah, I appreciate it because it's. Yeah. No, the, besides being a Penguins fan, I thank you for uh, coming out and bringing that to and, and kind of reminding me there of uh, something I wanted to ask these guys. I appreciate it. Okay. Our next question not sure if this was already asked is there wiggle room with the August 13th? 2018 possible start date can there be a pre labor day start but not as early as august 13th so i'm, I'm going to step out there and say probably not that that the, the the benefits that we gain by an early start you really only reap if you start early enough to finish the semester prior to the winter break so that kids can have a, a break where they, they have no expectations. Right now, you know, many of our young people go on break and they're gonna come back and they'll be faced with, um, with exams. So we, we've had some folks talk about, well, maybe we, over a couple of years, we could gradually back it up. You don't, you get no benefit uh, by, by doing that, other than you've, you phased it in over time. So if there is interest, and we'll find out if there's interest in the community or not, I think it probably is better to do the Band-Aid deal and get it done once. Uh, than it would be to kind of gradually step back over a period of two or more, two or more years. But we'll see. We'll see what kind of um, support we get from uh, parents when we do this next survey. And I think that's what we're seeing with some of our surrounding jurisdictions doing that phased approach. And yeah, I, you know, if that is what they're doing, because I think uh, at least Spotsylvania is moving back one week more next year or year after. Um, if we can get any data from those folks on challenges with that. It, it does, it does, you know, in the first year that you implement it, that's the year that you have the challenge because you, you get out at your time that had a regular start date and so your summer is, is compressed in the first year. Uh, but then you're out again, um, you know, early in the, um, well, it'd be late spring. So we'll, we'll see. The thing is, that, you know, the, the community want, it has got to say this is what we're interested in doing. And if it turns out that there's not, you know, pretty broad support, then, you know, I don't see us going that direction. Yeah, so all of those all of those things we see as as, as positive, right? We're we're in a position to get those to get those grades out. We finished the first semester prior to the winter break. Um, there there are from an instructional perspective, we think there are significant um, benefits. Uh, there are some challenges in terms of what happens with vacations. So again, we're gonna we're gonna survey. We're gonna have a new survey go out that will have two options: a, a, a post Labor Day option and a pre Labor Day option, and we'll see what folks think. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm gonna read both questions because they're both about the budget, and then probably help in one answer. So the first one: Can the pay ban for Paris be explained? And then the other one. Why are veteran teachers continually passed over for much needed raises? Without our veteran educators, we are nothing as a school system. Um, I'm going to have Dr. Benson ask the, or answer the more detailed, the, the explaining the ban, paraban um, pay scale. Um, he can probably do a much better job 
getting the actual, actual details correct. Um, the veteran teachers, it is a challenge. It's a challenge that we were all concerned with. What happened this year was it was a, um, you know, we did view the 1% that was given to the senior teachers, veteran teachers um, last year as a part of a, a misstep or a mistake that we made with publishing uh, scales. Um, they challenged us uh, uh, to make that mistake up to them. We gave them, gave the veteran teachers a 1% increase over and above what everybody else got last year. <clears throat> As we moved into this year's budget cycle, we were looking at, we had proposed to the Board of Supervisors a 2% across the board pay increase, which the 2% would have been paid out to the veteran teachers even in that aspect as the 1% from last year and 1% this year. Um, still a challenge, still looks like it's the veteran teachers that are being overstepped, being over, overlooked. Um, it's, it's, it's not the case. It is a challenge that we're working towards to improve our salaries across the board. We had a, a major challenge when I first came on board and some of my fellow members did of we had the absolute lowest starting salary in the region um, for new teachers. We've been working very strategically to increase that salary. This year we have reached or got, got very close to um, being at the median of the market for the younger teachers. Um, we had to do that by making an investment um, into enhancing the salary scale. We also wanted to ensure that we took care of professionals, uh, um, uh, staff that have been very underpaid within the market um, for a number of years, Par paraprofessionals, bus drivers, nurses, um, and other service folks. And we made a $800,000 investment into that salary scale to make improvements to their salaries just to bring them up to the very bottom, for the most part, of the salaries regionally. We look at those salaries in much more regional aspect than we do with some of our professionals and license, licensed personnel. We compare against all of our, our nine comparison districts, which are districts throughout Virginia. Um, and we made a budget priority starting at the beginning of the year to invest in the paraprofessionals, the service employees, the nurses um, to improve their salaries, and we stuck to that. When the Board of Supervisors funded our budget, there was still a five and a half million dollar gap, and we had to make up. Um, you're right, our big, big, biggest expenditure as an organization is our labor costs, our personnel, our human capital. Um, and that is where the biggest cost is, is where you're, you're, you're going to be able to balance a budget on. Um, obviously, you know, it becomes balancing the budget on the backs of filling the employee group. This year it was um, veteran teachers. One of the things I want to work towards is getting a 1% COLA built into our base budget. So every year, at a very minimum, all of our staff get at least a 1%. That at least gives us a starting point. And if that's in our base budget, uh, an item that you know we just are not going to cut no matter what, then being able to then add on an additional 1% or you know in a good year, a 2%, which would equate to a 3% COLA, um, I would be a lot happier as a member of the school board, as a member of the community, as a parent to know that my teachers, my staff within our schools, are all of our folks that are touching our students' lives are being better compensated. Um, you know, teachers are the backbone of our schools and we absolutely need to take care of them and, and it's, it's something that all of us all my fellow board members here do struggle with, and it's 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 the the number one topic of discussion on how we how we can better compensate people. So, hey, man.
Yeah, and right. just one other piece about the teacher scale. The, the board is targeting the median of the market right now. We had a very traditional step model in place before where we could not get all boats to rise high enough to, to get where we were out of market. And so there have been differentiated increases based upon how far away from the median you are. The farther you are, the bigger your raise is. You know, over a period of a few years, we've made significant progress. Uh, that line will start to level out, and we won't, we won't have as much discrepancy as we've had in, in previous years. But our entry-level salary is a little over $42,000, and we top out in the low 80s. So there's a $40,000 differential for, um, for teachers. And our teachers that are 15 years and, uh, and above generally are doing better than what the market says. So that's where the COLA gets applied. Uh, in terms of the pay banding, um, uh, when we did the analysis for our paras, we determined that it would take um, $2.5 million just to get them into the low of the market. $2.5 million to get them to the low, not the median, to the low. So uh, we implemented a, a pay ban model. Uh, the board put a half a million dollars into para compensation. We are differentiating para compensation based upon uh, the uh, amount of training and responsibility that paras have. And we've got three different uh, designations. So depending upon the amount of training and responsibility you have, you're gonna be in one of three uh, pay bans. It'll make us more competitive. We are gonna have to put money into this scale for several years to get the paras into the market. And, the, and I think the board is committed to, to doing that much in the same manner as that they had have done with, um, with teachers. I will, I will just tell you that sticking with a, with, with a step model, which is what we had for Paris too, it would be virtually impossible for us to improve their um, competitive position. So a pay ban model that's based upon market is a way for us to get there. Okay. Um, these are three questions all in one same topic, so I thought I'd go ahead and probably in one answer. Okay, so here's one. Will the school system address the need for diversity and diversity training for teachers and administrators? And then we have um, one from someone here. They didn't put a name. When a staff member is faced with racism and discrimination and no one does anything except punish the staff member, what is that staff member to do? And then the same person wrote, when a staff member goes to his or her supervisor, but instead of taking care of the problem, the staff member is retaliated against, what happens next? It's sort of all along the same lines. So w w we won't have any retaliation. I mean, we have a policy that, 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 that deals with retaliation. We are an inclusive uh, school system. We, em we embrace and celebrate um, diversity across the board, whether it's ethnicity or diversity of thought, whatever that might be. Um, we are stronger as a community uh, because of that. Uh, if, if someone has a personal circumstance that they feel like has not been addressed appropriately um, at the school level and they've, they've tried to do that, call me, okay? Because we will make sure that appropriate action is taken. We will investigate and we'll take appropriate action. Um, now, you know, sometimes the, the investigation might, you know, show us some things that might be a little bit different than the way it was perceived but we will absolutely investigate. Every, every person in this division is important to us, regardless of what, what their role is or their varied belief systems or you name it. And, and we, we value community and that's, that's what we're going to do. Okay. Like he said, yeah, okay. if, if there's any diversity issues that uh, any employee, any student comes across, um, and you know, we're talking about employees here, yeah, get in touch with them, get in touch with a board member because uh, it's something there. I won't be tolerated from my perspective, and I trust that Dr. Benson um, is right on that it will not be tolerated. And as, as we look at, um, at diversity and making sure that folks under, understand diversity, there, there very well may need to be opportunities for professional growth across the, across the division, but that, that's part of what we've stated in our value system with our new strategic plan, and uh, we're going to do whatever we need to do to make sure that that is, uh, is actionable within the organization. Since none of our high schools have met the college readiness benchmark, what outreach plans are there to improve this? It's that thing that we talked about um, earlier, right? Putting together a framework for expectations for kids thinking analytically, critically in classrooms across the division um, you know, as a whole. 
and that we have to say that that's important and that we are looking to see uh, our progress in making sure that kids are responding at that kind of a, a level. And I, I, I promise you it, it will improve our position in these assessments that, that gauge um, uh, whether or not kids are thinking analytically or not. Okay. Our athletic programs, especially football, seem to be able to draw national coaches from top universities to our schools. Why can't we coordinate with some of those opportunities to pair with informational sessions about those colleges and universities to our students and possibly parents? So we, th we think that's a, great, uh, that's a great opportunity. We're gonna explore that to see how we might be able to make a connection there. Okay. This is a two-parter. Why is there no policy or criteria in writing for academic achievement at the elementary and middle school level? And then number two, how can students be expected to set long-term goals when each year the invisible criteria changes and or it's not written to be referenced by students and parents? I'll start this a little bit um, because I'm hopefully going to lead Dr. Benson right into the answer. Um, we're challenged a little bit by all of our assessment is done essentially by the state level. We have to report the SOL scores and everything. Everything has traditionally been driven by SOLs. We have a couple of members of the, uh, I'm sorry, I don't want to beat up on anybody. Um, some folks say, well, we're, we're the largest um, jurisdiction that all of our schools are fully accredited, which is a great and wonderful thing, but that's like basic minimum skills. So that gets us there. So the things that Dr. Benson has brought to us and is implementing C5W to help us with all of our learners, um, I, you know, that's where I expect to see the, the improvements and marked improvements to get us higher on these national rankings, on these, um, um, you know, where we, are, where we lie within the state rankings of our academic ability and um, beyond. So we have to set those expectations in the, within the division and, and not be satisfied with meeting the expectations that are set forth by the Commonwealth, which is what we are getting ready to, to do. What, what does it mean to be a graduate of Stafford County Public Schools? And how is it that as a graduate you, you are able to distinguish yourself? And so that, that is gonna be our, our focus in uh, moving forward. There's another part to this question, though, that we might need some additional information uh, that has to do with students that um, received uh, all A's but not being invited to Academic Achievement Award Ceremony at the end of the year. I don't know if that question, is this from online? Online, Okay. Yeah, okay. Oh. So, you know, I, I do think there should be consistencies across the division, okay? We are a, a, a school system, not a system of individual schools, so there should be some things that are common in expectation and, and you know, what we recognize, how we recognize. I think there are some things there that we should be talking with elementary and, um, and middle schools about. I'm not so sure about the candy thing. There's a, we had a W up here for wellness. Um, and I'm thinking that the candy reward thing might not be the way to go, but I understand that there's, that's out there. Yeah. 
So I, I think we'll, we're gonna, we'll look into that because I do think there should be consistency and I, and I would wanna also revisit at the high school level to make sure that the criteria that we have in place are consistent and if they're not, why would that be? Um, okay. Okay, last two questions. Okay, why aren't all AP classes weighted regardless if the exam is taken or not? Some students sit for the exam and put their heads down and have no intentions of doing well on the exam. They just want the weighted grade. That's expensive for the parents and it doesn't help our stats for college readiness. I think I answered that one earlier, okay. right? Is it, we, we need to look at that because I, I feel strongly again that the curriculum is the curriculum, whether you've taken the test or not. You've done what you needed to do, hopefully, to be successful in the class and you've, you've responded, hopefully, also at an appropriate level of rigor so in my mind, there should be no difference in the way that class is, is weighted. Okay. And my student, my high school student, starts AP classes next year, and I didn't know this, and he is going to get a talking to about the importance of the exams at the end, not just putting his head down just for the credit. Thank you for whomever brought that to our attention. Okay. Last question here. Is there parent outreach at the elementary level of opportunities that are available for those who want to reach calculus in high school or be eligible for the CGS as freshmen? So school counseling is another area that we're kind of rethinking the, um, the focus that we have as a division and how do we make sure that, those, uh, that the information that we're sharing is consistent elementary, middle, and, and high. Um, we know that it varies right now to, to a fair amount of, of degree and we, I experienced that with my, my parent advisory group and had, when I had guidance counselors come in and talk about the things that parents are supposed to know about, but I clearly had folks um, there that evening that had not heard any of that, even though they had children that were at that particular uh, grade level. So we're, we're going to work on that consistency, <clears throat> part of our, our reorganization in our Office of Learning and Organizational Development. <laughs> Um, was, was to look to how we could provide support for guidance counselors in the division. And I had an opportunity to meet with a representative from each one of our schools, guidance counselor, and uh, they impressed upon me how important it is that they have someone in a leadership role that actually has a background in school counseling. Uh, so we're making that happen. Uh, and uh, I think that we'll see some improvement there um, next year. Well, this concludes the final listening tour. Let's give Dr. Benson and Mr. Hirons a round of applause for doing such a great job answering all the questions up here. We will conduct future listening tours next year, beginning in October. Thank you for joining us tonight. We'll also um, send around um, a survey so you'll get an email asking your thoughts on tonight's discussion. Um, and again, we appreciate you coming out. I hope this event has been informative and helpful. Thank you and have a good evening and be safe getting home. Thank you. Thank you guys. Oh.